option. By resisting unjust laws before the onset of total tyranny, we may be able to reverse the growth of power, thereby avoiding tyranny and the need for revolution. John Locke had some very interesting things to say about this. Quote, the state of mankind is not so miserable that they are not capable of using a remedy till it be too late to look for any. It does no good to tell the people, quoting Locke, that they may expect relief when it is too late and the evil is past cure. This is in effect no more than to bid them first be slaves and then to take care of their liberty. And when their chains are on, tell them they may act like free men. This, if barely so, is rather mockery than relief. And men can never be secure from tyranny if there be no means to escape it till they are perfectly under it. And therefore it is that they have not only a right to get out of it, but to prevent it. Second, the classic objection to the right of resistance, that it will undercut the authority of all law, was answered by pointing out that law can retain its authority only so long as it is generally regarded as just. When a government enacts and enforces unjust laws, it rebels against the principles of natural right and undercuts its own authority. Locke, Jefferson, and others never tired of pointing out that tyrannical rulers, not those who resist them, are the true rebels. The ruler must obey the same laws that are constitutionally prescribed for everyone else. Thus, whenever a ruler exceeds his constitutional limits, it is that ruler who rebels against the legal order and undermines legitimate authority. The right of resistance, therefore, is essential for, for preserving the authority of law because it demands that everyone must abide by it, including those in power. Third, who decides when a ruler acts unjustly, unconstitutionally, or illegally? Ultimately, insisted Locke, every person must decide for himself through the use of his reason. This is where many Americans, including, I'm sorry to say, some libertarians, have departed from their revolutionary tradition. They simply cannot grasp the notion that moral and political principles are capable of proof or demonstration. The view that law creates right, that there is no distinction between the just and the legal, is known in philosophy as legal positivism. Though this theory is often traced to the 19th century, and especially to John Austin and other utilitarian disciples of Jeremy Bentham, its true originator, in my opinion, was the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes. According to Hobbes, positive law, that is, enacted law, and positive law alone creates justice and injustice. So to talk about an unjust law is a contradiction in terms. Hobbes, a champion of absolute sovereignty, resolutely opposed the right of resistance, because to resist a law, by definition, is always unjust. We may be thankful that few libertarians, if any, subscribe to this form of positivism. Indeed, it's difficult to conceive how libertarian conclusions could ever be derived from this foundation. But some more conservative libertarians, while rejecting legal positivism, do seem to embrace it as a kind of procedural positivism, if I, if I may use that expression. While denying that law determines justice, procedural positivists often equate the two in practice. We may personally judge a law to be unjust, and this judgment may even be correct. But according to the procedural positivist, we should always defer to the decision of a court of law, and ultimately to the Supreme Court. It is here that the procedural positivist will, will wax eloquent on the separation of powers, that celebrated system of checks and balances that supposedly keeps the American government from becoming tyrannical. So long as we have an independent and impartial judiciary, one that will check the abuses of the legislative and executive branches, then the oppressed citizen should appeal to it for the redress of grievances, rather than taking matters into his own hands. The theory of checks and balances has a long and distinguished history dating back to ancient Greece and Rome. It occupied a place of pride in the writings of Aristotle, Polybius, Locke, Montesquieu, Blackstone, and America's founding fathers. I don't wish to denigrate the significance of this theory, which was a noble effort to limit the abuse of power through institutional barriers, 
but I do wish to dispel some of the myths and misconceptions that surround it. A key problem for Republican theory was how to structure political institutions so that governments would remain limited in their power and not degenerate into absolutism or tyranny. Every American schoolchild learns about the wonderful checks and balances of the federal government, whereby each of the three branches, executive, legislative, and judicial, checks the other two. What these schoolchildren are not told, however, is that even James Madison, the so-called father of the Constitution, was highly skeptical that this system would accomplish its intended purpose. Indeed, Madison later criticized this as a mere parchment barrier, parchment barrier, his words, to the abuse of power. Because each branch, following the natural tendency of power to expand, would encroach not inward into other political spheres, but outward into the sphere of society. The power of each branch would expand, Madison predicted, not by taking power from the other branches, but by taking freedom from the people. The real separation of powers, argued Madison in the Federalist Papers, was that between the state and federal governments. Individual states, jealous of their own power,